Good morning, church. It is a wonderful Sunday morning, and I am glad you are here to worship with us on this beautiful Lord's Day. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I would encourage you to maybe light candles in your worship space, inviting the light of Christ into your space. Uh, make sure that you've gathered um, elements for communion for a little bit later on, and your offering as well, so we'll have an opportunity to pray over that. I am glad you are here, and we're going to begin our worship with our Advent wreath. I dream of music that makes my heart swell. I dream of <coughs> trees that take my breath away. I dream of sunrises that wrap me in light. I dream of family dinners that feel like home. I dream of church services that give me hope. I dream of love as the default. So today, as we draw near to Christmas Day, we light the candle of love. May this light burn bright as a reminder that God is here and God is love. We are not alone. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. Will you pray with me? O oh God of love, 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 love indeed, you pour it out upon us and we so gratefully receive it. You love us, and so we are able to love you in return and to share that love with others. And this morning, we lift our hearts up to you. We ask you to come and be such a very uh, presence uh, in, our, in our midst that we cannot help but recognize that love permeating the air around us. We want you here. We want to honor you, to lift our hearts and voices in praise of you, for you truly are a God of love. So come, gracious God, come, Brother Jesus, come, Holy Spirit, come and be present in our worship this day. Through the power of Christ that we pray. Amen. Again, welcome. I'm so glad you're here, and I would encourage you. Oh, I called you up too soon. Sorry. Uh, encourage you to uh, open your hearts and minds to the will of God this morning. Our, our song that we're going to do next, our opening song, is "Those Who Dream." It is the theme song uh, that came uh, as part of our series. It doesn't have the words to it, but hopefully you've heard it a few times now, and you'll begin to uh, catch on to it. So let us sing "Those Who Dream." There's so much sorrow here, so much shame and hurt and fear. And this grief feels like the ache as 
Time to dream fierce dreams Like Mary did Brave dreams Like Joseph did New dreams Like Jesus did Cause those who dream change everything Those who dream change everything Time to dream fierce dreams Like Mary did Brave dreams Like Joseph did New dreams Like Jesus did Cause those who dream change everything Those who dream change I encourage you to gather the kiddos around because we have Miss Nancy here this morning for our children's moment. Good morning. Miss everybody, I hope you're having a good uh, vacation so far and that you have a great uh, Christmas. Um, you know, one of the most exciting times in any couple's life is when they find out they're having a baby. And then there's lots of things to do to get ready for it. But choosing a name for that baby is probably the most important thing that they'll do. And they choose it carefully because that person's going to have their name for the rest of their life. Sometimes they buy a book or they go online to find baby names, and they can choose a name with special meanings. So I looked up some of your names to see what they meant, and I found some for you. Luke means the bright one. Ellie means bright, shining one. Jacob means to follow or be behind. Eliza means my God is an oath or joyful. Lauren means wisdom or sweet of honor. Maya means water, calm, serene. Asher means fortunate or happy. Abigail means my father's joy. And Lucy means light. If I didn't name yours, look it up and find out. I just had to ask my phone, what does Lucy mean? And it told me. <laughs> when Mary found out she was going to have a baby, they didn't have a book, and they didn't even get to choose the name. God chose the name. He sent an angel to tell Mary what to name the baby, and the angel said to Mary, 
you will have a son and you will call his name Jesus. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. And Jesus' name was very important because the Bible says in Acts 4.12 that there is no other name that can save us from our sins. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for sending your son. During this season when we celebrate his birth, help us to remember there's salvation in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate that. I should look up my name. I wonder what that means. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, life in the community, just a, a few quick announcements. Uh, continuing the Advent study, that'll be tonight at 6.30. If you haven't joined before, it's okay. Uh, you don't, it's not a cumulative study. You, you haven't missed anything. You can come in at any time and start. I'll be doing that uh, tonight. And then instead of the Friday morning one this next week, I've moved it to um, Wednesday morning because next Friday's Christmas. And so if you want to do that one, um, be sure and let us know so we can get the Zoom link to you. And then uh, Wednesday evening at 5.30. So hopefully you can join us for that. And uh, this next week, uh, tomorrow, is uh, considered the longest night of the year, the darkest night of the year. Uh, not only is there going to be a Christmas star, which I hopefully you've heard about that, uh, but also it is our blue Christmas service. So uh, that will be available at uh, 7 o'clock on our Facebook page, uh, hopefully also on our YouTube page, and on the Martinsville Ministerial Alliance Facebook page as well. And this service is for all of us, because we have all experienced so much loss this year, and uh, this service is really going to cover all of that that we've dealt with, so I hope you can tune in for that. And then Christmas Eve on Thursday, we will have uh, at 5 o'clock uh, a service premiering here on Facebook um, at that time, and then for those brave souls that want to come out in the cold at 7 p.m., a handful of us will be gathered over on the Disciple House lawn. Uh, we encourage you to bring your own light, uh, a, a flameless candle, your cell phone, a flashlight, whatever. We'll have a, a brief reading of scripture, prayer, and sing Silent Night together for those who want to come out for that at 7 o'clock uh, Christmas Eve. And the next Sunday is Jazz Sunday. And I've already heard some of the music that you're going to hear next week and Trust me, you will want to be back here next Sunday for Jazz Sunday, so hopefully you can join us for that as well. All right. I think, oh, one more announcement. I almost forgot, almost forgot. Uh, we also now have our uh, Christmas special offering, and uh, our gifts support the work of the regional ministries uh, for, for the Christmas uh, offering. Our regional ministry is Indiana, is our region, and I can tell you what, the region has been so very supportive, especially of pastors uh, during this difficult time. So if you can support the region, uh, it would be much appreciated. Our regional ministry works to connect congregations to each other, foster faith development, gather disciples in camps, conferences, and assemblies, nurture the development of a new generation of pastors, assist churches in calling new ministers, uh, uh, and interpret the global mission of the church. They represent the church in ecumenical gatherings. Uh, they counsel and pray with those who are uh, troubled in spirit. Uh, they lead the church uh, to address, address racism. They inspire leaders to experiment and create. And they are a witness to the power of God to make things new. So this Christmas special day offering supports all of these and many other ministries of our region. And if you would like to give to that special offering, when you send your offering in, just mark it Christmas special offering, and we'll make sure that that gets to the region. All right, let's take a moment now to center ourselves on God's presence here, uh, to open our hearts and minds, uh, to, to be uh, connected through prayer, uh, a time that we will close with the Lord's Prayer. Will you bow with me? God of love, of beauty, of hope, of joy, of peace. We believe that this world is hard and it has been harder than it really needs to be, especially this year. A lot of things have been difficult, Lord, and we know you're fully aware of that. But when the world falls apart around us, we also believe in listening for the angels that say to us, do not be afraid. 
We believe in seeking out the Elizabeths in our lives that are there to support us, those who laugh with joy at our arrival whenever we come to them. They open their doors and their hearts to us. We believe, Lord, that healthy relationships can offer healing, and we know it is important to continue to connect with folks and to foster those relationships through the laughter of cousins, the joy shared between siblings, and the home found in partnership. We believe also in church family, in chosen family, and in the love that extends beyond family. We believe in friendships and in neighbors and in leaning on each other when the going gets tough. We believe in the triune God, lover, beloved, and love itself. Inherently relational, always connected, and never alone. We believe that that same belovedness exists for us and within us. We believe that we are loved and claimed by you, O oh God, never alone. And we give you thanks, O oh God, for a love like that. Holy One, in the midst of these trying times, we do have concerns on our hearts. Uh, and it is uh, comforting, Lord, to know that your love will cover all of those concerns. And so we pause here just momentarily to each of us have a moment, Lord, to lift our concerns up to you. God of love, we are so grateful that we can lay these concerns at your feet, that you have a desire to lift the burdens from our shoulders, to give us healing and uh, regeneration, Lord, to, to heal us and enliven us and those that we are concerned about. Uh, that is such a blessing, Lord, to know. And so we pause now to thank you for not only that, but the many, many blessings you have poured into our lives we are so very grateful and so very blessed. And so we pause now to give you thanks and praise, oh God. As a people so very blessed, Lord, we are grateful to be able to thank you for those many blessings today. And we are also grateful that we are able to be together in this way and that we can now blend our voices and say the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen our scripture reading this morning is from luke 1 26 through 38 the birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, kids say the darndest things, right? Art Linkletter taught us that many years ago. And um, Claire, who was five, and her very best friend, Olivia, who was also five, were in the church's Christmas program, the Nativity Play, together. And Claire was playing the part of Mary, and Olivia was an angel. And then there was this little boy who was playing one of the sheep. And before they started the program, he kept wandering around going, Hey, I'm a sheep. Who are you? And every other child would very politely answer him, including Olivia, who proudly said she was an angel. And then he got to Claire and he said, I'm a sheep. Who are you? Well, Claire looked at him. She goes, well, I'm Mary. Well, this little boy realized that Mary was a very important character in the story. And so he goes, well, you know, it's really hard being a sheep. And Mary looked at him. She goes, I know, but it's also hard being a virgin. You know, when I heard this story, it made me chuckle, <laughs> of course. But then as I sat with it, you know, the Spirit spoke to my heart, and I thought, man, their words are truer than they know. <laughs> it is hard to be a sheep. Um, and this past year, I say that because I have felt like a sheep many times. Uh, and if you're not familiar, sheep are not very intelligent, and they really, really need a shepherd. And so um, this year, last year, I've kind of felt like that, and maybe you have too. Um, they need a shepherd to keep them safe and well, because without a shepherd, sheep are so stupid, they will not move on, right? The shepherd has to keep them moving, or they will stay in one grazing pasture and eat it down to nothing but dirt and would starve to death without uh, that shepherd uh, nudging them on. And so this year, I felt a little less than intelligent at times as we've been trying to figure out how to uh, do and be church uh, in the midst of all of this. And I truly believe that if the Lord had cut, not kept nudging us forward, we might have just stayed right where we were and nibbled ourselves into nothing. <laughs> but then, you know, Claire was also right. It's not easy being a virgin <laughs> because we have ventured into virgin territory this year uh, in many, many ways. Uh, we've learned so many new things in the areas of technology and video production, just to name a few. Um, and it has been a challenging year, right? And uh, the, pan the pandemic uh, now even threatens all of our Christmas traditions. But here's what I know. No matter what, that baby, Jesus, is going to come on December 25th. Uh, and so I think we need to be preparing ourselves for that particular birthday. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks uh, for this exciting birth that is about to take place. And we ask you just now to speak to us and be present with us. Give us calm, clarity, and courage, not only for this moment, but for this week. Calm, dear Lord, that we will be able to hear your still, small voice as you whisper to us. Clarity that we'll understand exactly the words and messages you have for us. And courage, O oh God, that we will be among those who dream of the beautiful future you have for us. Through the power of Christ that we pray. Amen.
And so, as I said, it has been a challenging year. It has been a challenging Advent. Uh, but it's also good to remember that we are not the first people to face challenging times. <laughs> I think of Mary, uh, young and unmarried, and when her challenges really began was when that angel came to her, that angel of the Lord, and told her she was going to have a baby. Now, she was engaged to Joseph, of course, but the betrothal period was to last about a year um, and uh, if a bride was found to be unfaithful during that time, um, that was punishable by death. So they could have stoned her uh, for being with child. So being told that she was going to have a child through the Holy Spirit had to be so shocking to this young girl. Uh, and when you think about all that that pregnancy was going to put her through, to me, her response is even more impressive. Uh, it's no wonder that God picked her, right, to be the mother of baby Jesus. But did you know that God was the first to throw a gender reveal party? That's right. Now, he, he'd thrown him before. This one wasn't the first. But this is probably the most memorable one because of uh, the way he sent the, the messenger uh, through this angel. And not just any angel, right? He sent Gabriel. He pulled out the big wigs. He sent Gabriel in for this one. Um, and so he had this wonderful message uh, that he revealed to uh, Mary. But that reveal was kind of a blessing and a curse. As, as I've already said, she knew that the community was going to look down on her uh, once they knew that she was expecting. And her family, uh, they were probably going to be upset if they believed at all what the angel had given her in the way of a message. And so Mary, she decided she'd just get out of town. <laughs> she went to see her cousin Elizabeth up in the hill country. Uh, because Elizabeth was experiencing a miraculous pregnancy as well, right? So if anybody was going to understand what she was going through, it would be Elizabeth. Mary had this wonderful, wonderful news, but she was not sure anyone else was going to be excited about it. She didn't know if anyone else would even believe her. She must have felt some really significant isolation at this point. And I bet you can relate because a lot of us have dealt with isolation over these past few months. And I hate to say it, but I think we're going to experience more isolation before this pandemic is over. It's in the Gospel of Matthew that we read about the angel coming to Joseph. Apparently, the trend that God was setting there was that they got individual gender reveals back there instead of the husband and wife being together. It was a thing. Uh, but Joseph did not believe Mary, right? It wasn't until the angel came to him and set him straight that he believed the story at all. And then Joseph did, as the angel said, he took Mary into his home as his wife at that time, both to care for her and to protect her and the precious cargo she was carrying. And you might remember that Joseph was a carpenter. And so I can imagine that he got busy, right? He started upgrading his home because now there was going to be a family there. And so he would have had a lot of work to do. I also can imagine him starting to create a beautiful cradle for that baby that he knew would be in his home. And Mary, too, started gathering those things that you would need uh, as, as a baby was about to come. If you've been a parent at all, you know there are a lot of preparations you have to make before a baby comes, right? You have to get the nursery in order. Uh, you have to get all the necessary provisions, diapers and such, all of that stuff in stock. Mary and Joseph would have been no different. What was different for them, though, was that a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all, would, or all the world should be registered, which meant they had to travel to Bethlehem before the baby was going to be born. But I really think that they thought they'd be back <laughs> before that baby was born, or they'd be back soon after. I don't think they uh, ever planned on having a baby in a barn that was not uh, on their radar and the reason I think that is because we know that there was no room for them in the end so they must have at least tried that first that was their original goal right was to stay uh, in an inn somewhere but there was no room there and they wound up in the stable can you imagine the disappointment that Mary and Joseph both had this was not at all what they had planned. This was not the nursery they had prepared. There was no midwife. Uh, this was not the traditional birth scenario. There was no family there to support them. They were on their own. They were alone. 
And then later on, after the wise men came to visit them, an angel once again came to Joseph and said, take your family and go to Egypt where they will be safe. So, so much for that nice nursery they had all set up back in Nazareth. And yet God continued to make a way for them. He continued to care for them. He continued to make possible what seemed impossible because nothing is impossible for God. And you know, I think we can kind of relate a little bit to the disappointment that they experienced. We too are experiencing disappointment, are we? We're experiencing the disappointment of the absence of family. We are experiencing the disappointment of our plans, our traditions uh, being set aside. These are unprecedented times, and we can't even count how many times we have said or heard unprecedented this year. And yet, like Mary and Joseph, we too are learning to make do and to trust in God. To trust that God is going to make a way and that things will be okay. God can make a way where there seems to be no way. I want to share with you another birth story. And this story comes from Renee Duca. She said, I was nearly 16 weeks into pregnancy when my water broke. The doctor prescribed bed rest and instructed me to go to the emergency room when the miscarriage began. I stayed in bed for two weeks praying for a miracle, but it was clear the pregnancy was slowly coming to an end. The miscarriage was partially complete before we left for the hospital. The seasoned ER doctor who saw us mumbled to a nurse to get a fetal heart monitor on me and then dashed off to the next patient. The nurse returned with the monitor and began searching my abdomen for signs of life. She tried from every angle until the monitor was as low as it would go. Nothing. Then suddenly there was the unmistakable steady thumping of a tiny heart. I stared at my husband in disbelief. How much longer could the baby survive if there was no fluid in the sac? The nurse hastily examined what I had lost at home. Massive blood clots, she told us, as she quickly went in search of the doctor. My husband and I remained silent, not sure whether or not to be hopeful. An obstetrician declared after his examination that we had a live baby who needed to be saved. He checked me into the hospital. The next day, an ultrasound revealed perfect uterine conditions. I had plenty of fluid, a well-placed placenta, and an active 18-week-old baby. My doctor tried unsuccessfully to explain how several fist-sized blood clots could have escaped the sac along with large amounts of fluid and yet keep the pregnancy intact. I went home from the hospital on Mother's Day. And in October, my husband and I made another midnight run to the hospital, getting there just in time for our full-term son's marvelous birth. We named him Josiah, which means Jehovah heals. And Jehovah heals indeed. We are feeling broken, aren't we? We're feeling like a baby outside the, the fluid of that maternal sac or a fish out of water. We are trying to navigate a Christmas like no other. But if we can bring all of our disappointment and our fear to the feet of Jesus, there we will find healing and consolation. Something we so desperately need in the midst of all of our disappointments. In a gentle thunder, Max Licato said, there are many reasons God saves you to bring glory to himself, to appease his justice, to demonstrate his sovereignty. But one of the sweetest reasons God saved you is because God is fond of you. God likes having you around. God thinks you are the best thing to come down the pike in quite a while. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If God had a wallet, your photo would be in it. God sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning, he said. Whenever you want to talk, God will listen. God can live anywhere in the universe, and he chose your heart. 
and that Christmas gift God sent you in Bethlehem, face it, my friend, God is crazy about you. And so we come once again to that Christmas story, that birth of that baby. And it's so important that we remember this, uh, even in the midst of this unprecedented year, that many things have not changed. God loves you deeply. That has not changed. And is thrilled when you choose to spend time with the divine. Jesus was born of a virgin in a stable and was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. And if we are smart, if we are smart, we will invite that little baby to be born again in our hearts this week, today, and every day. For each day is a new day. Christ is there for us. Let us prepare the stable of our hearts for that birth day. We pray with me. Holy God, we give you thanks for the greatest gift indeed, the gift of your son, the gift of love. For that is truly what Christ is. It is love wrapped up in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. This week, may we seek to open our hearts wider to that baby. May we allow Jesus to fully take up residency in our hearts like he has never done before. May we set aside all our dis disappointments and our frustrations and our fears and fully rejoice at the birth of the baby. Thank you, O oh God, for your love for us. May we show your love to all that we encounter. It's through Christ that we pray. Amen. Jesus and his disciples gathered for communion, some or for communion for uh, the feast of the Passover many years after that first night where he was there in the stable. He's now in his 30s. He's an adult. He's been in Jerusalem for about a week. And those that he is with, they're very excited about what's happening or what they believe to be happening. But see, Christ knew what they did not, that the dreams that they had of taking down Rome was not the kingdom that Jesus was bringing to this earth. He looked around the table knowing that Judas was going to betray him and Peter was going to deny him because he knew about everything, right? He knew about the, the mock trial, the garden. He knew about um, the cross, all the horror that came with that. He knew about the tomb. He knew about all of it, and he knew what it was going to do to those at that table that he loved so very, very much. He had compassion for them. And so he tried to instruct them on how to keep moving forward in those difficult times until they were together again. Because, you see, he also knew about resurrection. He knew about the power and light and life and love that would flood the world through resurrection. The knowledge of that kept him there for that one last supper. And so he stood and he took bread and he lifted it to heaven, and he blessed it. He broke it, and he passed it among them. He said to them, take and eat of this, all of you. This represents my body, given in sacrifice for you. I ask that when you do this in the future, you remember me and my love for you. Standing again, he took the cup, and he lifted that to heaven and blessed it. And pass that among them as well. And he said to them, take and drink of this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. And when you do this, remember me and my love for you. For these gifts, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, 
we come to this table anticipating the coming of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. As we partake of the bread and cup, center our hearts and minds on the paths of peace, reconciliation, justice, and unity that you would have us follow as we walk in the paths of Jesus. Help our lives to be transformed by the presence of the Christ child, that the peace and love of the manger become the peace and love of the world. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. And through his blood, we are made new. Having been blessed by this time of communion, we now come to the time in our service where we have the opportunity to give back to God a, a portion of what God has given us and ask us to be good stewards of. And so we invite you to uh, lay your offering, uh, your tithe, um, your special offering, uh, prayers of intercession before the Lord at this time. pray with me? Gracious God, as we celebrate the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your gift of love and light. We come before you with humble hearts as we bring our offering. We ask your blessing and guidance in using these gifts to glorify you and serve others in this community and the world. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
challenge to you for this week is simply this, prepare. Prepare for that birthday that is coming up in just a very few short days. Prepare your heart, not just your home, not just your meals, but prepare your heart for the birth of Christ. Go with that peace that Christ can only bring. Amen. We're going to wrap up our service tonight. Uh, we have a, a quick video, and then we're going to sing Happy Birthday, Jesus. Lily! Lily! Lily, we need to go now. Have we found the keys yet? I can't find any socks. Look under the couch. Where, where is the gift for the pastor? All these socks smell like beef. Just wear your flip-flops. No, no flip-flops to a Christmas Eve service. We are doing pictures. Jesus wore flip-flops. Lily, we have to go now. I'm coming. Keys, wallet, pastor's gift. Lily. Lily, we have to, oh my goodness. Hi, Daddy. I made imitations. They're for Jesus' birthday. This one is for Mr. Johnson. Sweetheart, we, we don't have time to hand out the invitations. I mean, we, we have to go. Can I run over to his house and give it to him? Please, please, please. It's Jesus' birthday, Daddy, and everyone is invited. Of course they are. They look great. So do you. I know. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jesus, I'm so glad it's Christmas, all the tinsel and lights, and the presents are nice, but the real Happy birthday, Jesus, I'm so glad it's Christmas, all the carols and bells make the holiday swell, but the real Happy birthday. 